Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Craft and Business of Books with me, Tatiana Denford. Marissa is not here with me for this episode because she is due to have her second baby. So that's very exciting. Um, so it'll just be me, but I will still be approaching uh, this episode from the creative side and the industry side. So I will be representing Marissa as best I can. So this is the show um, that gives you the tools, the tricks, the stumbling blocks to the writing process, but also it gives you the not very often talked about behind the scenes stuff from the industry side. And um, we just wanna cover everything in between uh, just to give you guys a little bit more information about how to get your book on the shelf and not be intimidated by the process. We are on every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern, so please click the link below to subscribe and be alerted a, ahead of every, every episode. Sorry, I'm stumbling over my words today. So today we're talking about um, writing on mental health and motherhood uh, from a self-help perspective. Um, and these are topics that can be incredibly tender, powerful, divisive, but then they also connect to a huge audience. Um, and according to Nielsen, the self-help category has almost doubled in size in the last seven years. So it's, and it's reached total book sales of 18.6 million last year, and more books are being published into this space more than ever. The number of titles in this category has nearly tripled from 30,000 in 2013 to 85,000 in 2019. So it says a lot about how people consume these books and how probably helpful they are. Uh, journalists and critics speculate that uh, this, is, this rise is a response to uh, general social changes, especially the world as it is right now. Um, but also in the mindfulness about what we need um, and how we regard ourselves when it comes to certain parts of our lives. You know, so you, it makes space for everyone, basically. So I'm sure if you go to a place, a bookstore, even a grocery store, you'll see so many self-help books on there. And they're all so different. It can be the four-hour work week. It can be he's not, he's just not that into you. So whatever it is, it connects to people on so many different levels. And I think, you know, yeah, I think what writing, in particular on motherhood and mental health in this category, um, you know, I, I think it's a particular challenge because not only to the writer, but the publishing industry, because it doesn't necessarily fit the mold. It's, um, it's layered, it's nuanced, um, you know, and I think these kind of books um, with this theme, it helps people to kind of dip in and out of them. Uh, and they, they kind of cherish those books over the long term because it's all, there's always a question, especially about, you know, when it comes to mindfulness and learning more about yourself, there's always gonna be questions, um, you know, on the journey. So, um, yeah, so we've, I mean, we have covered memoir, but uh, this, kind of comes into that category as well, but this is um, leaning more towards self-help and with mental health and motherhood. So, and from a creative perspective, I'm interested in how an author approaches this um, because it's not only hugely connecting to so many people, but I'm sure it's also quite tender and it could be divisive, but then at the end of the day, you're kind of discovering your own truth and trying to share it. So, and that's the truth of, you know, all of these stories. So um, we've covered lots of different memoirs. Uh, this in particular is really interesting. I mean, you know, my questions are going to be, is the market saturated? Um, you know, how do publishers view it? Um, and, you know, like Matt Haig uh, said about writing about mental health, it basically saved his life in a lot of ways. So that's why something like this is so powerful. Uh, our guest today, Maggie, um, she's written extensively uh, in this space. And I mean, I'm, I'm really thrilled that she agreed to chat with me today. Her book, not, How Not to Fall Apart, Lessons Learned on the Road from Self-Harm to Self-Care came out from Penguin Random House in 2018. She is a mum to a toddler and has had what sounds like 
very cool jobs in the past. So she's very eclectic, very creative. Uh, I'm not going to bring her on right now. Hello, Maggie. Hi. That was How such a lovely you? intro. Thank oh. you. <laughs> and it always embarrasses our guests. They're like, I'm sitting here listening. Yeah. <laughs> you talk about me. I'm blushing. So um, it's really good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Oh, no, it's, I mean, it's, it's really lovely. And I think, you know, uh, it's such an important topic. But, you know, I think from both, you know, we see it talked about all the time, but I think going behind the scenes and talking about the creative process when it comes to, um, you know, writing a book like this, but also from the industry side, I think, you know, because there, are, I'm sure there are so many people who would love to write books like this because it is probably so cathartic for them. But they're probably wondering, well, I, you know, it's such a personal journey and like to submit it to somebody, you think, God, if I get rejected, it's kind of hurts on a maybe a different level, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so we always begin to kind of see what people are working on right now in particular when you've been kind of in lockdown for a while. Mm -hmm. So what, so what's going on with you currently? I'm so creatively speaking I'm trying to to focus on another book so a second book so um how not to fall apart is what it's called in America and then in uh, the UK it's called remember this when you're sad um and it's non-fiction but I really want to attempt a, a a fiction book next so it had definitely had similar themes um around mental health about someone who um is suddenly unexpectedly pregnant when they're 28 and they've had like a you know a huge history with being in and out of mental health wards you know how can they see themselves as a mom when they're not you know when everything's sort of leading up until now and they're in their life seems so sort of anti-maternal so how can they kind of collect all those things together and make a decision about you know the next chapter of their life um so it's definitely got huge amounts of things that are like in you know my world and things that my experience as well but it's it's kind of nice to to not have to link it all back to me even though all of the names are like people that I work with or like that I know <laughs> and I'm just like oh great name yeah I'll use it all, all great um, so, but I'm very at the beginning stages of that. So I'm trying to kind of get that together. And, and I mean, this is probably very familiar to you, but it's kind of wrestling with like, should I sit down and like plan the whole thing out and then start? Or should I just kind of like dig in and just go as I go along? Yeah. And, and you shared a post on your Instagram, I think yesterday, the day before about someone who was like writing out, you know, their plan for that novel. And it was like really visual and a beautiful flow chart. And like, I was really tempted to like run to the stationary store and be like, got to get my highlights, got to get a brain map. But I could also see myself like wasting a day just yeah. doing this. Yeah. So I'm kind of like, yeah, a very at the beginning stages of that. Yeah, that was actually Sarah Langford that, oh, great. that I shared. And um, I'm, I'm hoping to have her on at some point, but I know yeah. a lot of, I know a lot of um, writers who do plan that out. Me in particular I just I, I can't I can't do that I've always they call it pantsing it so you know I, I've always sat down to write like a jumble of pieces that eventually will kind of turn yeah. into something I've never kind of looked ahead now I think so I was going to actually ask you when you were writing remember this when you're sad which is such a lovely title by the way <laughs> it's just it, there's there's something so fragile and hopeful about it at the same time. I just, I, I love, was that your original kind of title or did they kind of adjust it? Uh, yes, that, that was actually one of the first titles that came out. I really wanted to call it Trash Baby because I had an ex-boyfriend that used to always call me Trash Baby and I quite liked it because I kind of felt, I felt a bit, a bit trashy is the wrong word, but it just kind of really encapsulated how I felt and just, I was a bit yeah. messy and all over the place. Um, but my agent was like, yeah, like it doesn't mean anything. Um, so I might keep that for the fiction bit coming later. But then, you know, we were kind of brainstorming lots of different things. And that was sort of maybe the first thing that came bub bubbled up to the surface. And luckily, yeah. the publishers liked it. Yeah, it's wonderful. And I think, so, so I was going to ask you, the how did you find the courage to write this book where did you where did the seed happen did you get to a point in your life where you're like i want to share this because it's helping me did it have to come out or do, did you ever see that happening in the future did you see yourself writing a book first of all 
Uh, I had always dreamed of writing a book. Um, you know, it's something that hadn't happened yet at that point. I was writing for BuzzFeed and it was part of the the time when confessional writing was like at the forefront wow. and to, to a point where it was almost becoming exploitative. Like if you were a woman and you'd been through something, you know, particularly shitty, you know, someone right. out there was probably going to publish your story. Like yeah. it was definitely, that was the time. Um, but I think, you know, the good side of that is I definitely felt sort of brave enough to like write. I remember I wrote something for BuzzFeed that was like five things to know if you've ever, you know, dealt with depression. Like it was pretty simple, yeah. but it like drew upon all my personal experiences. And, you know, I kind of like put it out there. And that's the very different thing to like publishing book to publishing something online is that you get that instant feedback. So yeah. like it's online and you're like, <laughs> Um, but the, it, it was really positive um, and I got lots of really great comments. So it was, it was part of like, it was really cathartic for me to put it out there, but it was also really great to know that I wasn't alone and that it, I was being able to be useful despite all of the you know shit that I was going through. Yeah. And so that kind of laid the groundwork of like, okay, I've spoken about depression. Maybe I can also speak about self-harm. You know, maybe I can like into other people about their conditions. That's broadened the scope. And I was doing that for probably about like a year or two. Um, and then uh, my now agent approached me and she was like, well, what have you ever thought about sort of writing, you know, a larger piece of narrative, you know, around all of these tiny small bits that you've kind of strewn out of, of over the internet? Like, can you combine them into a book? And so that's where that, how that kind of came about. Wow. So it, do you think the evolution of that, because it was slow, it allowed you to kind of be comfortable or it conditioned you to be comfortable with the idea of kind of releasing this into the wild, as it were? Yeah, for sure. And I, and I think that's part of the process for me in um, uh, kind of dealing with things is that I, I need to write it down. And ideally, I need there to be an audience, whether it's a therapist or whether, you know, it's like a, a random friend or if it's the internet, you know, which is complicated. Like it's I think everyone has a complicated relationship with the internet. Um, but it's, you know, the internet has been around for me for like a really, really long time. I've practically grown up online. And so, you know, I was part of internet forums, like weird internet forums when I was, you know, from 13 onwards. I've always had that kind of strange relationship with the internet. Yeah. So to be in a position where I could like kind of spill my guts out and get that instant feedback, is, it's kind of what I needed in like a weird way. Yeah. You've, I've seen kind of how you operate, as it were, kind of online. And you're, you're, it's really interesting because you there's a confidence there, but not in a, I'm feeling myself all the time. There is a, there's a confidence in your honesty. And I think that comes across so well. And I wonder if that also enhances the fact that people feel like they can really listen to you, listen to your story and kind of understand it. Because... There's no um, adornment, if that's the case. You know, there is an honesty, but it's sometimes dealt with in a really funny way. Sometimes, you know, it's like it's like take you as they see you. You know, yeah. I mean that that's definitely the goal. I think sometimes I'm guilty of kind of pushing everything out there so that you know, well, at least if I put everything in other people's corner, then if they sort of let me down or if they think I'm like weird or crazy, then, you know, it kind of confirms my hypothesis about myself that I'm like deeply unlike <laughs> what everyone hates me. Um, so part of it is that kind of like, you know, I'm just gonna like perform it all over people and like see what happens. Yeah. Um, but I do, but I do think humor is, is definitely the thing that connects people together and that, you know, it's it's easier for me to write something and be a little bit more lighthearted about a shitty thing that's happened. And then knowing that, you know, someone else could read that and it might not make them sad. It might make them kind of laugh, but they might also realize it's something they've been through too. So it's that kind of like connecting factor. Yeah. Like I've never been very good at making friends. Like I've never had like loads of friends. So like the way I communicate online has definitely been a, a way of like forging those like online friendships, I guess. Yeah. Do you have a, a good support system around you? And have you, has that kind of gotten stronger since you've been really kind of open with your? Yeah, definitely. I, I do know that it was, it was hard for my family in the beginning, like especially in sort of like my BuzzFeed days of writing where I was like, you know, because BuzzFeed was like a factory, like we were churning out articles like left, right and center. 
Um, and I think they there was definitely a contrast between like who I was online and who I was in real life, which was like really close, really introverted. You know, if you asked me about my self-harm scars, I would just be like, oh, yeah, let's not talk about it. Whereas online, I was like going into detail. Yeah. Um, but as I kind of grew out of my 20s and, you know, my book came out and I kind of learned that I also needed to open up, you know, in real life and and with my my family and people that are close to me. Um, and so over time, that that has definitely helped. And I think, um, you know, becoming a mom, I was 28 when I was pregnant. Um, it kind of it made me really kind of get the people that I suspected were my support system, but really rally them together and forge them into like, you know, a solid network. And like, you know, my mom stayed with us for two weeks after I, I gave birth to my child, which is something I never would have imagined would have happened. Yeah. And like, and here she was. And when she left, I was like, oh my God, don't leave me. Oh. You know, we haven't necessarily always had that relationship. And like, since becoming a mom, you know, I think it's quite common. It's like, my mom is the most important person ever. Yeah. yeah. And it, what's interesting is that so creatively, it's like it sounds like in the beginning you put on this costume creatively because you were a different person. So you tried it on and you were operating in a very um, raw way with this costume, but you were so different. And it's like that creativity conditioned you to kind of put the two together and suddenly kind of, you know, open up more than you would have ever expected. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's been like a really important growing process that like took a long time, but we got there. Yeah. Now, writing wise, because you are a mother, how do you carve out time? Because we all know it's practically impossible. <laughs> uh, is it early morning? Is it kind of evening after bedtime? Or is it kind of, you know, stolen moments how do you work so it was definitely a lot of stolen moments and then you know the pandemic hit us and we went into lockdown um and I'm also you know the sole breadwinner so like I don't do well in my job or if I lose my job then like we're all kind of screwed so like there's that this pressure of like I have to work and I have to do it well so like where does writing come in um and the only way I've been able to like manage all my time is every evening I make a schedule for the next day that is literally hour by hour of like what I'm doing, what my boyfriend is doing, so he looks after our kid, you know, when I'm with her, all this kind of thing. So that, I, that my brain is really dedicated to whatever it is I'm doing that hour. And so I try and get in at least an hour or two of writing or reading or researching. You know, sometimes my writing is like two hours of mum's net, just like, oh, look at these crazy stories. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, Which is fine. It's yeah. good material, yeah. <laughs> For sure. Um, so that's kind of, I once accidentally sent my schedule, instead of sending it to my boyfriend, I sent it to a colleague, and he was like, oh, my God, what is this? And I was like, oh, this is, like, my schedule for the day. <laughs> and it was so embarrassing because it was so detailed. It was like, 9 to 10, have a shower. Um, but that's the only way I've been able to manage sort of everything and writing. So it's just having that really sort of regimented plan of what yeah. my day can look like. I love that because... I am terrible with boundaries. I'm terrible with schedule. I just say yes to everything. And then I act like a martyr and then I resent everyone, you know. So yeah. I, I bring it upon myself. Whereas a, a lot of a lot of writers are saying that that's exactly what's needed is boundaries. And it's so important. I mean, we talked to Courtney, mom, the other day. And she was saying that she dedicates two days a week to like not answering phones, not going out, mm -hmm. not seeing people. She literally has feral writing for two Amazing. days, you know? And I don't think I could, I, I don't think I could do that only because I'd feel really guilty. Yeah. You know, and maybe that's something we as kind of women tend to do a lot is just feel guilty. But um, I, yeah. think, I think if the roles were reversed, I think if a man was like, like, oh, I don't need to do anything but write for two days, like he'd have no problem with that. Yeah. It would be fine. No, for sure. And that that's like, you have to like zone out of that guilt because it's also, it's like not just writing, but if I'm not writing or if I don't have any kind of creative outlet, yeah. then like my mind just goes really fuzzy. Like I need it to be able to like expel some of the stuff that I'm doing. Yeah. So it's like also self-care. And like then, you know, then it's easier to prioritize, I think. Yeah. 
Do you find it difficult when you are writing about something that is about mental health, motherhood, self-harm, because it's so profound and it's based on your experiences, do you find that there are days where you really can't get anything out because you feel like it's too raw or do you find it helpful? Yeah, I think if I'm if I'm going through like a particularly like depressive episode, then it's like it's really hard to write. I mean, it's hard to do anything, so let alone, you know, write. So I definitely have to be in a better space and also a good enough space for like if I'm writing about something that is like bringing stuff up, I have like time. It's like my therapist, um, she used to, my old therapist used to say that, you know, ideally after a therapy, therapy session, you would go and spend an hour like, getting a massage or like you know having a bath like doing something that is like post therapy whereas normally in your day-to-day life you're like oh straight gotta go shopping gotta go to work gotta put my kid up yeah you know similarly to writing especially if you're writing about you know difficult stuff you kind of have that time after to kind of like process everything you've been thinking about yeah and then there's also the aspect of like you know you write something that is you know a big deal to you and then you put it out on paper and you're like oh but this writing is shit and so, you know, you're not able to express how you're actually feeling. That's frustrating too. So that, that kind of comes into play. Yeah, because, I, and, and you know, writing anyway, in general, you have to get through that kind of sludge mm. in the beginning to get to polish the good stuff. Whereas I think it's probably then adding on top of that is kind of trauma that I'm sure that then like you look at that and you think I'm a terrible person suddenly like for writing something that's so personal but writing it in such a bad way you're already judging yourself anyway with writing and then you're adding on top of that self-hatred you know yeah yeah it's like layers and layers of stuff and then sometimes also I was you know when I was writing a little bit for the book I'm working on now I was kind of drawing up on you know I have a very like regimented way of of looking at stuff sometimes like when I has a little bit to do with OCD so when I pick out like clothes for my wardrobe like if it's a Wednesday I pick like a certain section for my wardrobe it's like just how my brain wants to operate and I was writing that into this character and then I was imagining like let's say my agent or someone reading this and they'd be like oh get rid of this this isn't who does this This, no one will do this and And you're like I would (laughs) this is literally what I do but it sounds when you write it down it sounds so weird like why would someone have a yeah. section of their wardrobe that they pick from on a certain day that's so strange yeah. um but, it, but it's but it's life yeah and you, do you think like because people are going to be watching this feeling you know emboldened by obviously what you're sharing do you think this is something that people really need to condition themselves to do which is self-acceptance within writing something that is so painful you know yeah for sure but but also i guess not to you know, to push it, um, especially what I was kind of talking about, you know, that time where lots of women, especially women in their 20s, were like really actively being encouraged, you know, it was the time when like Exo Jane was huge, like yeah. conventional writing was everywhere. But I think, I'm not saying that I've ever met anyone who regretted writing an e- a personal essay, but don't feel like, you know, you have to stir up a bunch of shit to like kind of, you know, get a lot of hits on an article. Like, you know, you don't yeah. have to, you can write about other stuff as well. Yeah. And I think that happens in so many ways, especially now. I think because everybody's conditioned that, you know, the internet, particularly social media, when articles are shared, that is that Instagramification, there's a danger of validation, you know, where you're sharing a part of your story. If it gets lots of shares, lots of likes, and the magazine that you're writing for gets a clout, you're like, oh, I'm a a much better person for that. Where if it doesn't, suddenly you feel awful. And I think you know, you raise a good point, which is don't, you know, don't let them use you for that because it's, those are boundaries as well. You're allowed to say, you know what? No, that's too, that's too hard for me. I can't do that. You know? Yeah, yeah, a- absolutely. And I, I remember in the sort of like publicity time of it, when it came out in Holland, I was like front page of this news website, you know, talking about having borderline personality disorder, And when I was doing the publicity for the book, I was pregnant at the time. So like the headline was kind of like, you know, and she's pregnant. And then all the comments were like, oh, I feel so sorry for her unborn child, blah, blah, blah. She's going to be a terrible mom. And, you know, I think that's definitely something that I or like the publicist could have protected me from because that was bound to happen. But in my head, I was like, well, it's part of the book to be confessional. So I'm just going to like lay it all out there. Um, But like you, you don't have to do that. 
No, it's like you don't have to take it. That that's the yeah. thing. It's like you're standing there going, okay, you can throw abuse at me because they asked me to do something that's really relevant. Like it's it's really sticky. Yeah. Isn't it? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. What was the hardest? If you don't mind me asking, what's the hardest? Um, what was the hardest thing to write about in your book? I think. Well, I think in general, writing about self harm is really tricky because it can be so triggering so quickly so you can't really write about you know what you're doing or how you're doing it you can only write about how you're feeling but you can't also go too into the feeling because it might be triggering for you and it might be triggering for someone else to read it so you kind of have to like skirt on like the outlines of it and I wrote um a bit in in my book or something happened that like it happened quite recently so when I was writing it it wasn't originally planned to be in the book, but it was that I was sexually assaulted. Right. And I think at, even at the time of writing it, and even now, you know, there's still a huge thing in my brain that was like, well, it was kind of your fault that like you were kind of drunk, you know, that kind of like guilt narrative. So even in writing it, like I never say rape, I always say like sexual assault, because even when I was writing the book and there had been some distance between it, you know, I was still too scared that someone would come and be like, actually, it wasn't really right. And so that's, I think that's when there, I don't regret writing it, but I, I do think the time had been, there hadn't been enough time in between yeah, the writing and the event. And so you can tell, like, when I read it back, that there's definitely an element of like, yeah, I'm too scared to really go into this. Like, I'm definitely, yeah, the way I'm talking about it is kind of like still on the surface. Yeah. And you, you know, the way your brain works when you talk about that just now, it's interesting because most women are conditioned to approach the subject that way. Well, yeah. it must have been, there are always excuses made. And I think, I'm, I think so many people are so grateful that writers, including yourself, are approaching it in a way that's like, this shouldn't be taboo to talk about. It shouldn't be talked about in an apologetic way. I'm talking about such deeply, you know, painful issues, but that's part of some people's lives. I mean, self-harm is prevalent. Mm -hmm. you know? And why should somebody feel like they're hiding from that? If they feel like they want to talk about it, they should talk about it without hesitation, without self-judgment, you know? And I think you're kind of making it um, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so no, I mean, that's, you know, and that, I, I think it's also helpful that you're, you're trying to tell people not to judge themselves for approaching it in whatever way they need to in order to heal. I think that's really yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, for sure. So I'm going to uh, represent Marissa uh, in this section. So I'm going to ask uh, a few questions about the industry side. So and she has given me things to ask, which is mm -hmm. very helpful. So if you see my eyes drifting, it's because she's kind of giving me mm -hmm. yeah. just, <laughs> so um, You've said that while writing the book, there were times you felt in balance and times you didn't. Do you feel that's reflected anywhere in the book or do you feel that through the process, um, you ended up with something that feels like completely one way or another, if that makes sense? Um, yeah, it does. I think, I think it's always hard to write about sort of your actual life when a lot lots of things are still in flux. Yeah. I think um, I'm really proud of the work I've done. I, I think it would be a very different book if I'd read it, if I'd written it now. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there are times, you know, like the sexual assault element, like things that were like too raw and recent that I was, you know, haven't, I hadn't like ironed it out in the way that I think I would have if, if more time had gone past. And I think, you know, that's the, the risk of, of publishing something that still feels quite new. Um, at the time so that that definitely I, I I can see that I mean the other thing is that I'm a bit like with my book it's a bit I can't I can't ever make a recipe twice like once I've made it that's it I will never make it again yeah. and I have a little bit of that vibe with the book is that you know people now will tell me about it and it's almost like it's something that doesn't really belong to me it kind of belongs to a bookshelf somewhere it's kind of like yeah. Yeah, that was like a thing that happened. But yeah. like I'm almost too scared to dive back in in case I read something that I'm like, oh, that's like really babyish or that's a really stupid phrase. Yeah. Like I don't want to really engage with it. Yeah, it's like watching yourself in a movie or, or hearing mm. yourself 
hearing your voice on a conversation. Yeah. It's like once you're done, you're done. I, I, I completely understand yeah. where you're coming from. Yeah, it's like now it's out. And actually, in a way, when you said it belongs on a shelf or it belongs to other people, you're so right. I think in particular with mental health books, it does end up belonging to so many people because they are using it for their own to help themselves. You know? Yeah, it's not yours anymore, even though yeah. it's your story. So I get that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, did you did you identify any relationship uh, between your mental health and the process of uh, publishing the book? So, for example, were there any parts um, in the publishing process that made you feel anxious, or that alternatively that positively impacted you? Um, I think, you know, when it, when it came out and especially when, when it came out in the Netherlands, I had a really, really, really talented person behind it. But I think, you know, the, like looking at the people that she supports now, she was like hugely famous authors. And I think she really wanted me to kind of like go for it. Like if it had been up to her, I would have been on like every talk show, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, and you know, I was just really not comfortable with that. I was also pregnant and feeling quite sick. And I was like, I was not really like up for like flying back and forth between Holland and, and London. And so, you know, I don't know if I let her down, but I, but I don't think I like delivered all of the things that she wanted me to do. And I think that you know, it's kind of part of the thing, well, it's out now. So like, it's not that I don't want to do the work, but I don't want to like do this extreme hustle, especially when it's public facing. Like I was definitely all right doing the like, you know, writing, like writing for magazines and other outlets to kind of promote the book. That's all fine. But like me being on camera and having to like talk about it, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. Whilst I, I am Dutch, I kind of struggle to like speak emotionally in Dutch sometimes so like having to then talk about you know borderline personality in Dutch it's like a whole thing yeah. so I think that's where that was definitely a, a struggle in terms of, of publishing um a thing that I'm sort of quite proud of that I did was that you know you kind of imagine that you have a book and you have this big book launch like in in your head you know you're gonna have this like fancy drinks and blah blah, blah but actually you know, they're kind of a waste of money, you know, people just come for the free booze and then they leave. And so, you know, there's definitely a world, especially now with the pandemic, where a lots of publishing companies are like, well, let's not, you know, do a book launch. So I wanted to do something, um, but I didn't want to make it all about me because that kind of freaked me out. Right. So I kind of turned it into like a, an open mic night where I got like my friends to do some readings and like a band that my boyfriend was managing to like do an acoustic set. And it became this kind of creative wow. opening. And then, I, and then I read a bit of my book at the end to kind of shove it in there. Wow. Um, but that was, I was really, really pleased with that. And like loads of people came, which I was like, I just couldn't believe. You know, we had this pub like filled with people and like, you know, people that I love, people that I really knew. Um, so that was something that I'm, I'm glad that my anxiety to do something publicly kind of turned that into something I was comfortable with. Yeah. Um, fully owned it and like organized it myself. And it was, it was really good. Oh my goodness, that's one of the best things I have heard about a book launch. Because yeah. I, I guarantee people will always remember that kind of book launch. You, yeah. go, you go to events and you're right, it's the same drinks and it's very pretty and you have a center table with lots of you know flower arrangements and cookies made in the book's cover. And, yeah. and everybody kind of has conversations that they necessarily won't remember. You know, they meet a lot of people, blah, blah, blah. It's like a wedding. And then yeah. you go, and it's lovely, and then you move on. What an amazing idea to have something so organic that means something. Because then also, you're going to remember that. And that's something that will kind of, I don't know, I, I, feel, I almost feel like it will remind you that you're doing something that means something to you. You wrote a book that really meant something, and it means something to other people, you know? I think that's, what a great idea. Yeah, yeah, I, I really recommend it. And I've said it to people, you know, with books coming out, it's like, ditch that whole like Prosecco thing. Like go to your favorite pub, rent out a space and just like make it the type of evening that you'd want to go to. That is amazing. And also it sounds really rock and roll. I, <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit. <laughs> oh, I love that. I can imagine at the end of the night, people have their hair down, like like their eyeliner smudged, music. It was messy. Like, it was messy. Oh, that's so great. Oh my goodness. Um, if I'm ever lucky enough to have a book launch, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. <laughs> do it, do it, absolutely. Um, 
So, right. So um, we're going to come to the end questions. But actually, before we do, I just wanted to ask you, because um, I've loved this chat. What do you, what would you advise somebody who particularly wants to write their story? How would you, what would you tell them how to approach it? And how do you, you know, because obviously you got an agent interested, which is great. And other people will have to submit, you know, and it's really quite terrifying. Um, how would you tell them to prepare for something like that? I think kind of like get rid of, you know, any expectations that you have about the publishing industry. Like I didn't know anything. And, you know, when I did get approached by an agent, I was like, what the actual hell, like <laughs> what is happening? And then, and then she also said, it's like, you know, you can have an agent. It doesn't mean you're going to have like a bestseller tomorrow. Like it's still, and like, I'm also definitely not like my agent represents a lot of people. I'm definitely like at the bottom of the food chain, which is fine. Like I'm, I'm lucky to have one. But like, you know, all of your expectations and like how kind of to get in, like I, especially, you know, at a time when we were pitching the book, it, there were the market was very saturated. And like there was definitely a, a feeling of there were lots of similar books coming out at the same time. And we tried it for maybe like a year and a, a bit with yeah. like it was almost getting to like a green light stage. And then they'd be like, no, oh, we've got a very similar book. Now, so we're not going to do it. And that happened again and again and again. So I did get to a time where I was like, well, maybe this just isn't the time for this book and that's fine. Um, but we kind of kept it on the back burner and then eventually someone, you know, was interested. And I think, you know, that's something I didn't know about. I didn't know about that process and kind of, you know, the best ways to kind of go into it and be like, I'll see what happens. I don't know what's going to happen. I'll see what happens and, and kind of take, you know, every day as it comes, but, but really just try and write it for you. Yes. Um, and you know what you want to have out of it and and you know kind of imagining like my daughter reading it like how would she feel about reading this you know would she you know not that I knew that I was going to have a baby at that time but kind of or imagining your future self you know yeah. what would they want to know how you know you wrote this and and what you're what you're writing about um and don't you know, don't write for anyone else in mind. I think, you know, there's been so many times in my life where like maybe I, I had like an ex-boyfriend that I really wanted to prove, you know, he did a bad thing. So I was like, I'm going to write the best book ever so that when it comes out, this guy is going to be so sad, <laughs> um, you know, and, and, there's and then I get into like this like writing frenzy and it's like, oh yeah, it's going to be amazing. And then you read back and you're like, oh, it's not. And and the thing I'm, I'm definitely guilty of as well, and I'm trying not to do it with this new book is that I we'll start getting an idea yeah. and then I'll write, you know, maybe a couple hundred words and then I stop and then I imagine myself on Oprah and then Oprah is like, welcome to the book club. And I'm like, yeah, no. and then we have, you know, this whole thing and I'm on TV and then Reese Witherspoon buys the rights and it becomes a Hulu show or whatever. And then I lose track of the actual thing. Yeah. And then I get back to it and I'm like, oh, it's not really good enough. I'm, I'm going to yeah. stop allow yourself a really brief time to fantasize about Reese Witherspoon buying your book and then stop and then just get to work like just put words down on a paper and like you said like once you have you know that sort of like rock you can start polishing it yeah. so just kind of get the words down and I think then you're in a, a much better position to start fantasizing yeah and I think you know what the, the um you know the, the most important thing is writing for you you have to write what you know, you have to write what you love. And I think, I honestly think that it's so easy for human beings to uh, see through people's veneers. So if, if it looks like you're doing it for a specific agenda, it will come across in your writing, it will come across in how you talk about your writing, how yeah. you present yourself, and, you know, and it's, it's funny because a lot of times I see people who are a really slow burn, but they are so consistent in their words and their message and their voice throughout. You think that's something to be proud of, you know? Um, otherwise, you're like, you're looking for the fancy book deal, which are the exceptions, not the rule. And you get that. And then what? What have you learned? Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's also okay to kind of like try out different hats, like, I definitely, I don't know if it's part of my mental health diagnosis or just me and my personality in general is that I don't necessarily feel like I have a distinctive voice yeah. in a way that like um, a Tessa Moshveg, is that her name? Like, you know, there's like authors that you read and you're like, 
yes, I know who they are. I can recognize them any day of the week. They always have that like sick voice. You're like, yes. And like, I don't necessarily feel that I have that because I'm always changing and evolving and yeah. you know, whatever. And I think kind of accept that about yourself as well. Like don't feel like you have to be this like voice of your generation that everyone will know, you know, where you are immediately, but yeah. you, you know, you can change and you can change over time and what might be a self-help book one day, maybe the next thing will be historical fiction about World War II, like it's possible. Yeah, and that's, and and again, one of our guests talked about that and she was saying, I don't have a marketing plan for who I am as an author. There probably won't be name recognition. Meanwhile, she has four books under her belt. Yeah, They're all different. And I think that's who she is. Deep down, she is um, an artist. She's She thinks in a very creative way. For her, her path isn't linear. You know, I don't think I could do one thing the mm. whole time. I love kind of, I, could, I love learning something new about the way I write about certain yeah. things and trying out different genres. And I think that probably resonates with you too. Yeah, definitely. So uh, let's go to my first fun question. Uh, oh. If you could do anything for work other than being an author and kind of doing the job that you're doing now, what would you do? I would, I mean, I would love to be a child psychologist or a school counselor. And then I'd probably steal all their stories and like turn them into a book. But <laughs> I I love kids. I think they are so great. I'm fascinated. I could just like watch kids in a park, which sounds so creepy, but just like imagine yeah. what, they're, what they're talking about. You know, it always feels a little bit Lord of the Flies, like they're always plotting something. Yeah. Um, and I, I would love to just be surrounded by that. Yeah, well, because it's stories, isn't it? You're you're witnessing stories kind of come to life. For sure, yeah, it's yeah. great. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you could share uh, about yourself or your writing process that's a piece of trivia about who you are that no, not many people would know? Oh, interesting. Um, I wish it was something cool, like I listen to, you know, classical music when I write. Um, I so I actually when I started writing I was writing poetry for um a website well for myself but I was posting it on a website called ABC Tales which is a really really lovely writing community um it's not really an interesting fact but it, it definitely helped me it was in a time where I had really bad anxiety and I wasn't ever leaving the flat and I was at university like everyone else was like partying and drinking and I was literally just like listening to Bright Eyes in my flat by myself. Oh, oh Bright Eyes, I love Bright Eyes. Oh, that's <laughs> Bright Eyes. <laughs> um, so I was writing these like sad little poems, but they kind of, it was definitely like a, a real like kick up my butt. Like this is something that you love, you know, and you're kind of good at it like go for it. This is something that you should keep doing. Um, and another like thing I guess about the writing process that I read a lot, like I read a lot of books. I love reading, always reading. And I have this document uh, on Google Docs called Hecatomb or something, which is like a word that I didn't know what it meant that I picked up in a book. But anyway, I kind of keep, every time I read a phrase or a word that I think is really interesting, I, I keep it in this document. So I've had it for years. I mean, it's like pages and pages long. Um, and so if I'm ever like stuck for inspiration, I'll kind of dip back into it and kind of let it sort of spark something. So, uh, okay, then actually that leads me to kind of maybe a different part of this question. Do you speak another language? Do you speak Dutch? Yes, I speak Dutch. Yeah. Ah, okay. So favorite Dutch phrase and what does it mean? Um, this is so typical of my brain because immediately I had to think of the phrase that foreigners always learn when they come, which is noka in the goka, which means having sex in the kitchen. <laughs> oh my God. Like, no one uses, you know, it's like a weird phrase that like foreign people are obsessed what? with. Like when you asked me that, first thing that I thought of. So that presents a whole host of problems in my head, both hygienically and logistically. <laughs> like no one's doing it. Dutch people are, they're sticking to the bedroom. They're not very like adventurous. So. <laughs> <laughs> what so how do you pronounce it again noka in the coca okay <laughs> right i need to write that down that's amazing um, <laughs> thank you for that um so the last question i'll ask you is what would be your desert island book you're only allowed to pick one. Oh, so tough because i read so much and i don't really have a thing that i would necessarily return to um, 
I recently have finished uh, my year of rest and relaxation, you know, which everyone loves and I love. And I think especially if I was on a desert island, I would probably like be nice and calming to kind of like dip back into it um, and imagine, you know, my own year being similar and hopefully then a plane comes to save me. Um, <laughs> but also like, you know, I could say like Harry Potter, but like, you know, recently the author is oh, yeah. <laughs> kind, of, kind of ruined it for me. Yeah. So. <laughs> Otherwise I would say Harry Potter. Yeah. Well, Maggie, this has been so much fun. Thank you. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed it. I am so honored that you shared so many parts of your writing process, especially about themes that can be really tricky to talk about. Um, you know, and I think everybody who's watching who wants to attempt to write their story, you've kind of empowered them, you've made it okay, you've kind of, you're, you've opened up the door, even if that, I, I'm probably embarrassing you, but I think you know, you've opened up the door for, for people to say, hey, this is my story and it's okay. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I love that. I hope so. Thank you so much. It's been lovely. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Well, I mean, I'll tell you, I think what's been really helpful about this episode is not only about writing parts of your life that are so that can be traumatic, that are painful, but there's so much hope in it. And I think writing about motherhood and mental health um, shouldn't be a scary thing. And I think Maggie's just proven to us that like there's a process by which you do it. And basically it's being completely unapologetic about it. It's being self-assured, but also never judging yourself on trying to get your story across. Um, you can find Maggie on Twitter. She's also on Instagram and her book is available to buy everywhere. So um, I really hope you guys have enjoyed this episode, even though Marissa wasn't here. Um, remember we are on every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern. So remember to click the link below to subscribe to be alerted ahead of every episode. And thanks so much for being here and I'll see you next week.